All right, good evening, everybody, and welcome to our program, Flood Prep 101. Um, I want to level with all of you. We have gotten a lot of water in the last couple of weeks, whether it's come in the form of snow or rain. And right now, where I'm sitting in Terre Haute, Indiana, we are predicted to get one to two inches of rain within the next 48 hours. Um, and the ground is already sopping wet. So that means that right now in February, we are looking at potential flood conditions. If you look at the National Weather Service, it is saying we under, are under a flash flood watch. Right now, to me, just uh, without any expertise behind it, I have no data to say it, but right now, to me, it looks like we are in for a really wet spring, unless conditions change a lot. So what I wanted to do is I wanted to make sure I supplied you guys with some basics of how to just make sure you're prepared for any flooding events. Depending on where you live in Indiana, you could live in places that are very flood prone or your businesses could be involved in flood prone areas. And it's good to just kind of go over some of the basics of what you can do to properly prepare your property and your family as well. All right, so I wanted to give you a few facts too. These are some of the things that always stick out in my mind. Um, Indiana has had a lot of really, really strong flood events throughout its history. Uh, the Great Flood of 1913 was marked. It flooded the Ohio, Wabash, and several other watersheds surrounding it. The Flood of 1937 was rather infamous. Um, it went through the entire Ohio River Valley, right at the southern end of Indiana, due, after some severe winter storms, and put that area under about 10 feet of water. And then for those of you who were living in Indiana in 2008, you probably remember when the White River flooded. Uh, it flooded several towns along its length, including the town, one of the towns I work in, Spencer, Indiana. Um, our 4-H fairgrounds were completely submerged underwater for a few days there. I also want to share with you a little bit of a story that I like because my wife and I once had the opportunity to visit Rose Island near Charlestown, Indiana. This is a part of a state park, and what it is is Rose Island is an abandoned amusement park. It was destroyed by the flood of 1937. And back then, this was the real deal. This had all of it. It was an amusement park that had a swimming pool, petting zoo, a very expensive hotel. Um, guests were ferried to Rose Island um, by a steamboat going down the Ohio River. Um, and it was, it was kind of the place to be. And what happened was, unfortunately, when the flood of 1937 happened, it quite literally put the park 10 feet underwater. If you ever get the opportunity to visit there, which I strongly recommend, I've got a few pictures of our visit, you'll see some very, very interesting sites. The actual island itself sits at a lower elevation compared to the surrounding state park that it's in. What you're looking at right here is the dock, or what used to be the dock, where people would get off of the steamboats and be able to walk through these kind of gate things into the park itself. There are no buildings remaining. The swimming pool is still there. I, unfortunately, I couldn't find our picture of that. Um, but one interesting thing I thought too was neat is that this bench was still there. This bench was submerged in that flood and it did not get entirely washed away. It didn't get torn apart. Uh, but obviously, when you look at it, you can see that it was definitely underwater for some time and it is permanently damaged. However, it's still standing after all that time. So if you ever want to go see it, it's definitely a very, very, it's a very beautiful and very eerie experience. But it's known as Rose Island in, near Charlestown, Indiana. All right, so let's get to a little bit on flooding here. There are a lot of hazards when it comes to flooding, and unfortunately, we human beings are kind of terrible at thinking about those hazards. So flooding, what we typically forget is the fact that flooding can spread infectious disease very, very easily. Um, you do not want to go wading in flooded waters. That means that sewage tanks have been flooded, city sewers could be flooded. You do not want yourself in that kind of situation. That is a very easy way to get very, very sick very quickly. Flooding can damage structures quickly in a flash flood or slowly over time as the floodwaters build. Um, unfortunately, what this means is you could see a big flash flood that just takes a building out. And you can find plenty of uh, videos of something like that on YouTube and other places. Or you could see as waters begin to rise, building foundations will get eroded. Walls will slowly begin to get knocked over as the pressure and movement of the water over time relatively 
slowly, just begins to crush and damage structures. Water is heavy. Water has a force. And as it builds, it will push things. There are very few things that are just going to stand there and not be moved. Uh, flooding also represents a very easily underestimated threat to our lives. I cannot count the number of times I have heard of people driving into floodwaters. Um, another story I could share with you is my sister, uh, when she was serving in our military, lived in Norfolk, Virginia. And as she was moving back home, there was flooding occurring in Virginia at that time. And she drove through it in a car that was rather low to the ground and her engine flooded out. And that was a very dangerous situation for her because at that point, um, your car is never moving again. You can't compress water in an engine. And uh, those waters could have kept building. People lose their lives because they think they can drive through floodwaters. And there are numerous other hazards associated with flooding too, more than I could just fill with a simple program like this. So, but the message that I want to get home to you guys, and you're here obviously, so you think this too, flooding is a danger. And it is one that we unfortunately it underestimate constantly. So there are some factors to consider here. I apologize, I was letting some people into the program that I want you guys to kind of take home with you as you think about flooding and the kind of preparation that you want to do. One of the biggest ones, and I think probably the most important one is where you live matters. So if I use myself as an example, um, I live in Terre Haute, Indiana, which means that I have a river right next to me. Now I'm lucky my property is on an elevated area. There is a floodplain beneath my property that I can actually see stretching out in my neighborhood. So I am relatively safe, but there are maps and other things you can look up. Um, inprepared.org is a great one. I'm gonna show you that later. Uh, we'll actually help you find topography so you can see what, are, what flood prone areas are near you. And when I looked it up, sure enough, my house is adjacent to a flood prone area but thankfully we are not in it. Um, if you suspect that you live in an area where flash floods occur and you think a flash flood is going to be happening, um, don't wait, get out. Don't wait for an evacua evacuation order, have a plan ready to go and get out of there. Make sure you've discussed that plan with your family because if you already know that you live in an area that's adjacent to a river, a place where you've got floodplains nearby, or if you're like me and you live in a valley or other body of water, you know that these things are gonna happen. Be prepared ahead of time and take initiative. Don't wait for someone to tell you to go. So the other thing to take into consideration is how do you make a plan? It's very easy for me to sit here and say, I have a plan and get ready to evacuate. That's a tall order. We're talking about potentially picking up enough things for you to be able to survive with for several days. That is nothing easy to digest. Oh, and I see Patty is pointing out Coco Ross. Um, it, that is an excellent thing to volunteer for. That is very, very pertinent to this discussion. So I encourage all of you to take a look at that. And I'm happy to provide you information on it too. You can also follow them on Facebook. So how do you make a plan with this? How do you actually prepare? Well, the first thing is know the flood warning system in your community. Not a single person on this call would ever mistake a tornado siren. We all know what those sound like. We know what that warning system is. Know the warning system for flooding too, and make sure that your family knows those warning systems. Always keep fuel in your car. And that is great for any kind of inclement weather or potential disaster. Uh, one of the things that I grew up learning when I was a teenager is my mom and dad always told me when it's this cold outside, keep at least half a tank of fuel in your car. And that advice is solid. Make sure you keep emergency supplies on hand and maintain a checklist for them. You can find these checklists at IamPrepared.org, and I'm going to show you that a little bit later on as we keep going here. So let's talk about monitoring these conditions. This is one of the things that I actually enjoy because as a pilot, I get to monitor all kinds of weather conditions and I think it's just kind of neat. There are lots of great resources like the National Weather Service, which you can get apps for on your phone, on whatever device you use. And the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration will also offer updates on severe weather, environmental conditions, and the trends that they'll follow. If you're just looking for easy stuff to monitor, I strongly recommend just keeping tabs on weather.gov. That'll be our National Weather Service, and it will give you information. Uh, it, usually the information is going to be tied to whatever weather monitoring stations are nearby. So 
here in Terre Haute, what I do is I'm looking at it and it's giving me information related to our what's being monitored at our local airport. Um, stream data, actual water body data, can be found at the website I've linked here, waterdata.usgs.gov, and you'll be able to find that material there. I also recommend that if that's something you want to explore a little bit when it comes to this, you may also want to consider contacting your local soil and water conservation district. They would be happy to have, help fill you in and help you kind of look at different things so you are a little bit better prepared and understand your local watersheds a little more. Now, I mentioned keeping fuel in your car. And this, to me, this is kind of common sense stuff. This is, you probably already know this, but you know what? It never helps to go over it again. When you're planning for fuel, keep enough to operate for at least 100 miles. Pretty easy stuff right there. That's, for most vehicles, that's like a third of a tank if you're driving a decent, smaller vehicle. Um, operate under the assumption that electricity will fail, meaning gasoline pumps will not function. So that means that you're going to want to potentially store fuel in your shed or your garage or whatever safe place is going to be able to do it. Make sure you store it in a place that is relatively climate controlled and in an approved container. I don't know if you guys recall, but a few years back, there were some major disasters and on TV, you could see people grabbing fuel and try to load it into plastic bags, literally plastic shopping bags. Gasoline and other fuels are reactive, folks. They will go through lighter plastics. They will literally dissolve them with enough time. Fuel approved, approved containers for fuel are what you should be using. So please, if you're going to store fuel, do so appropriately. Now, emergency supplies are very, very important. We, you could uh, refer to this as your go bag. Now, inprepared.org has checklists that you can print out to prepare a go bag for yourself. And, and it's going to include things on there like considering basic first aid items like bandages and antiseptic blankets, make sure you have all your prescriptions, um, non-perishable foods, including for your pets. So folks, I got three dogs and one cat. They are my fur kids. So that means that when I'm doing this, I'm planning on food for them too. You're going to want to make sure you have quick cooking equipment. And the most important part, you need at least two quarts of water per person. If you are looking at a major flooding event, that means that potentially well water sources and city water sources have all become contaminated. So you will not be able to draw water from them. You need to make sure you have enough water stored up to be able to get through that and get your 100 miles distance away from the flood event until you're safe. Now, IamPrepared.org, I keep mentioning this one, hosts a lot of information on several emergency situations. Um, they include, though they're not limited to, tornadoes, flooding, extreme heat, and thunderstorms, and extreme winter weather. It's all a great bunch of information that's been assembled by several extension specialists and our state uh, specialists there. Um, this is just an example of the checklist that you can look at, the home emergency kit. And you can see here, it's just a lot of common sense stuff, but it may not be things that you may necessarily think of. Like, for example, they list a whistle to signal for help. Um, your phones may not stay operable all the time. You may not have easy ways to contact people. Make sure you've got chargers and a backup battery or a solar charger. Um, we actually have solar chargers for our phones because we, we are outside a lot. Um, liquid bleach for water treatment. A lot of us may not consider that one. Fire starters or pet care items like I was talking about earlier. Just lots of good stuff here to help you kind of check off everything that you may need to think about. Because to be honest, folks, when I think about the stuff, half of these things don't even occur to me. So I want that checklist. I'm going to need that checklist to make sure that I'm prepared. Now, this is going to be kind of critical here, sources of water. Keep in mind, as human beings, we need water quite frequently, whether we're brushing our teeth, cooking our food, or just purely for drinking. But when we're talking about a flood event, and this can even go for, say, fires or other types of extreme weather, um, we have to assume that certain things are going to happen, like water sources becoming contaminated. You have to assume, just like the slide says here, that any incoming water, i.e. water not yet in the pipes in your home, has been contaminated. 
Begin by shutting off the main lines to protect the clean water that's already in your system. Make sure you've got all the valves closed on the water coming out of your house too. You want that water to stay in your system. Now, when the warning is issued for potential flood events, stockpile the water in large containers, pots, pans. This is one of those ones where you don't have to worry as much because there are lots of containers that can hold water for you. You can actually get emergency sources of water from the different sources in your home, like ice cubes, the water that's still in the lines in your home, even the flush tank of the toilet, not the toilet bowl. The flush tank is still going to be uh, clean water, so long as you've maintained the quality of the flush tank. The bowl is not. Don't drink water out of your toilet bowl. Um, in a pinch, soft drinks and juice can be used as substitutes for drinking, so don't ignore those either. Now to retrieve the water in the pipes in your home, what you want to do is open up a faucet in the highest point in your house uh, to allow airflow. So that way you, the water will actually come out. It's not going to create a vacuum within your own pipe system. And then run the water in a lower area. Now most of our water heaters and pressure tanks are going to be able to provide about 30 to 60 gallons of safe water in an emergency so long as they have not been flooded. Keep that in mind. If I use my house as an example, I'm on city water. I can actually go downstairs, see where the city water inlet is, and I can hear the sump pump that's connecting me to it. If it floods, if my house, if I were actually unlucky enough to have a flood, I would have to assume that my water tank is already contaminated because it's just simply too close to the source. If you're getting water out of your pipes or out of your water heater or tank, make sure you shut off any gas or electricity to that water heater. If that heater empties, you could cause an explosion. So please, if you have a water heater and you're gonna to try to retrieve water out of it during a situation like this, shut them off. Be safe. Now, refrigerated foods and other things. Um, there are a lot of ins and outs about this one. So I will try to go through it a little bit carefully here. A lot of it's simply going to be things will spoil quickly. Um, or most of your meat will spoil fairly quickly. You, if, if you're looking at emergency situations, if you have enough time to prepare, can just consider cooking all the unthawed meat because that way you'll have available foodstuffs that are probably gonna keep a little bit longer. Eggs can actually be kept for several weeks in a cool place without refrigeration, depending on the hardness. And hard cooked eggs are safe for five days, but not longer than a week at room temperatures. Then you will have bacterial development. Hard cheeses are actually gonna keep well at room temperature, whereas milk and softer cheeses like cream cheese, those are gonna spoil real fast. So don't assume that they're gonna last you. Sour milk will only be good for baking or use in cooking. And even then I would be a little bit hesitant to take that step. So I would play it a little bit safe there. Now, when it comes to our produce and gardeners, this might interest you. You will have to be a little bit careful here. So like I said earlier, floodwaters will spread bacteria. They will spread contaminants and they can get into your garden. Fruits and vegetables are particularly easy to become contaminated. I'm sure all of you have heard of different salmonella outbreaks and different things like chives or lettuce or what have you. Immature produce that's more than two weeks away from harvest, you can actually recover because by the time they get to the point where they're gonna be harvested, so long as they're not still flooded, obviously, um, they will have been cleaned off enough, they will have grown past it, they should be okay unless they get exposed to raw sewage or livestock waste. And then you have to assume that you're looking at a potential outbreak situation. If the flooding was light, avoid using produce mature enough for harvest, or I'm sorry, unless the flooding was light, avoid using produce mature enough at harvest at the time of flooding, because that means that any contaminants will most likely have gotten into that produce and they will not change after that point. So this is a lot here on this slide. I'll try to summarize it a little bit here. Leafy vegetables are going to be very, very susceptible. This is why we typically hear about outbreaks in different leafy vegetables and we hear recall products and things like that. So you have to assume that they will not be safe. However, root bulb and tuber crops are actually going to be a lot less susceptible. You just need to wait a couple of weeks before harvesting then disinfect them with a very, very light bleach bath and then peel them. Produce with protected, like a protected fruit that has an impervious cover or a thick rind, like a melon, eggplant, or winter squash, 
should be washed and disinfected in the same way than peeled. Leave them in the field as long as possible to reduce contamination. The good news is that these harder uh, fruits are actually going to be able to survive that fairly well and they'll be disinfected a lot easier. So long as sweet corn is above the level of the flood water and immature at the time of flooding, they should be safe, but you're still wanting to make sure you cook it thoroughly before you consume it. Okay, so a little bit of information on prepping on the farm. I know a lot of us may live adjacent to farms or farms may be a part of our families. So I wanted to cover at least a little bit of information on that. Um, and if nothing else, if you know someone who has a farm, you can also share it with them as well. So when we're prepping on farm, this is the, these are the kinds of questions you need to ask yourself. What kind of livestock is present and how many animals do you have? What kinds of heavy equipment are present and how are they stored? And how is power provided to the farm? Now let's pause here for a second and consider this. It doesn't matter how big your farm is. Whether you have a few chickens out back on your property or you have a whole bunch of beef cattle, the rules are gonna be the same here. You're gonna be taking the same things into account. So let's dive in a little bit here. So if possible, move any machinery, any bagged feed, pesticides, herbicides, and valuable tools to higher elevations. This is critical, especially if you have pesticides and herbicides. And folks, it doesn't matter if you have a garden or if you have a whole farm. If that one of those pesticides or herbicides gets flooded, that means that now that stuff is in the floodwaters. And that is a situation that nobody wants. So please move those things to higher elevations. Machinery is going to contain oils, fuel, other things that could be very contaminating, so get them out of there. Motors and portable electric equipment like PTOs, things like that, should be moved to a dry location and wrapped in a heavy trash bag. You will have to assume even when you move these things to a high location, there is still a potential for them to get flooded. So we're gonna to wanna to try to protect them as much as possible. Try to prepare immovable power units and machinery for flooding by sealing radiator openings, remove air cleaners, seal all openings into the device itself and like the carburetor, any kind of piping. That way that engine doesn't get flooded out. The goal here is like, when we're talking about power units like a generator, or something that has a motor. If it has any kind of motor, you don't want any flooding to get in there because if let's say it's an electric motor, the flooding could contaminate and cause the coils to become contaminated and the thing will just burn itself out. Or if it has a um, something that has pistons, again, you can't compress water. So you'll just simply bust the thing the minute you start it. That's why it's so critical to get these things sealed up in a flood situation. When it comes to livestock, again, whether you have backyard chickens or whether you have a whole bunch of cattle, fill tanks for the livestock and plan for their needs for several days. Remember, we, these are not only our food, they're how we live and they're, they're kind of our partners as we go about farming. We need to take them into consideration. Give them high places to escape to, construct mounds where you can provide high ground or open gates to allow them to escape high water. You can also put out bales of hay where they can stand on them. Um, I, do, there, I know several really bad stories when it comes to what's happened to livestock when flooding. I'm not going to share them with you here, but what I will say is please consider your animals, make sure they can escape. Um, if you need to drive animals to move them, longer swims in calm water are actually better than short swims through swiftly moving currents. If a, if a current is very quick moving, even if it's only for a short distance, think animals will get knocked over and that can result in their death. So please only move them through calm water. Dairy operators should also plan on grain placement, temporary milking facilities, and whatever kind of legal restrictions you may have when it comes to milk dumping. Um, there's a lot more there too that needs to be discussed with people who may have different businesses. And if you have questions on that, please feel free to contact me. I'm more than happy to get you in contact with someone who can get you more information and help you do the research you need to do. All right, so that was our flood prep 101. I've got some contact information there. Uh, please feel free to use it anytime. I also have a link to our Purdue Ed Store, which has publications on this and more, as well as a link to our Purdue 
plant and pest diagnostic lab, which can help you solve a lot of different plant related issues. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and stop our recording.